to go right into the word. And uh, this last song couldn't have been more perfect. Uh, we're talking about Let Heaven Come. And we have been in this series that's entitled The Paradox of Power. And today's subtitle is The Great Exchange. Amen. And I want you to open up your Bibles to the second book of Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. When you have it, will you please say amen? Amen. We read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you are enjoying this series, The Paradox of Power? It has been powerful, let me tell you. Um, it has really shaken me up, and it has uh, really impacted my life as we've been studying it. Um, but one of the great myths of Christianity, and we've been kind of touching on it a little bit, is that we, as Christians, we think that we have to get our lives together. We have to do the work. We have to get our lives right to be accepted by God. And we couldn't be further from the truth when we grab a hold of, 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 of that and, and take it to heart. We, there is nothing in our power that we can do to be accepted by him. This teaching is not taught in the New Testament. It's not your job to repair your broken soul. It's not your job to try to take away all the things that you deal with. It is God's. It is your job to trust in God's work enough to let him do what only he can do. It is your job to trust him in a way that you allow him to replace all the old with the new life that he has offered you through the cross and Jesus' death. So let's take a moment to clarify the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You may have heard the word covenant. The word testament and covenant, they're interchangeable. Both words are translated from the same Greek word, and I know I'm going to butcher, I do not speak Greek, but it's diathic, diathic, I don't know. Um, I don't know if they have it, but no. Matthew 26, 28 says, This is my blood, or the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Covenant, or testament, it means an agreement or a pact that cannot be broken without the death, the death of the testator, the one who is granting the pact. Um, in some cases, the covenant doesn't even come into, into action until after the testator has died. For example, a will or a promise to give an inheritance that was, secu um, that was, a secured, that was secured through a covenant. The Old Covenant or the Old Testament was a covenant or a pact between God and his people of Israel. The Old Covenant was heavily dependent on man. Since man, God's people, they entered this covenant, they made a pact with God to be in his promises that they would accept the requirements to live life perfectly. And any failure to live life perfectly would deem penalty. So basically, the old covenant was, okay, you are the people of Israel. You are God's people. You are going to enter into my promise. So that means you have to live by the law. At the heart was the Ten Commandments. The, however, there were many, many, many laws. But it started off with the Ten Commandments. They were the foundation of the Old, the old and Testament law. If God's people broke the law, the law had penalties. Let me bring it to modern times. In the world that we live today, every country, every nation has their own laws. 
If you want to live in this country, for instance, there are laws that you have to abide by. If you don't abide by the laws, there are penalties. You can get stripped of your possessions. You can be jailed. You can be fined. There are penalties when you break the law. So in order to be a citizen of God's kingdom, there were laws that needed to be kept. And any violation would place that person under the judgment of that law. But yet, look how great and merciful God is. Yet because God knows, knew that man could never measure up to the law based on heavenly standards, he put provisions in the middle of the law. He put these provisions to protect man. He would allow man to substitute an animal in their place where they could bring an animal and the animal would be judged by the law in the place of themselves. This is why there were sacrifices. This is why they, they, they would have these ceremonial sacrifices in the Old Testament. It was a temporary atonement of their sins. The people would bring a lamb um, before the priest. The lamb would have to be examined. They were requirements of the law. They couldn't just bring any old lamb. This lamb had to be perfect. It had to be white without blemishes, without any spots. Then the lamb would stand in judgment instead of the people. Now, as you read the scriptures, you know that this was a foreshadow of Christ who would become the Lamb of God for all people and he would be judged for sins so that you and I would be able to walk in freedom. Amen? Under the old law system, man would never experience fellowship with God the way it was originally intended. The Old Testament was a never-ending cycle. It was a never-ending cycle of failures to try and keep the law. There was a never-ending cycle of sacrifices, attempting again and again every year to make things right, but failing to keep it. And God's people never experienced the promise because the law was based on a spiritual ability that men lacked. So it was impossible to walk in the promises. You see, the law was never intended to make people right before God. That's where we make the mistakes. We think that the law was established to make us right. But that was not what God intended. It was intended to show mankind that he needed something greater than himself to reach God. Many people still believe that they can make themselves good. Many of us live our lives thinking, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this in order to be accepted by God, in order to make myself a better person, in order to be right before God's eyes so that I can please him. But that's not what it's about. The purpose of the law was to expose sin, not to create righteousness. Romans 3.20 says that by the law, no one will be justified in God's sight. For by the law, we have the knowledge of sin. So we are not to, to, to be righteous because we follow the law. It's to show us how much we need God. It's to show us how much we need Jesus. Let me give you an example that reveals our imperfection. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said, you shall love your Lord God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. You see that in Matthew 22, 37. But sadly, churches, they teach this and they misunderstand the point of this message. Jesus presented this to a group of lawyers, people that would study the Old Testament law. He presented this law to those who falsely believed that keeping the law was what made them good, was, was made, what made them righteous. It was presented along with the second greatest commandment. Do you guys know it? Love your neighbors as yourself. To prove to them that they were not righteous, Jesus used these commandments to shatter the self-delusion of people who thought that they were good because they were further along than other people. Because if you know anything about history and the Jewish people, the elite, 
the scholars, the, the, the lawyers of the law, um, they would look down on other people because they weren't righteous enough, because they didn't follow the laws to the T like they supposedly did. But Jesus here presents them with two of the Ten Commandments and just crashes their theology down because he's like, first you got to love me, God with all of you. All of you. Then you got to love your neighbor just like you love yourself. But instead of being loving to others, they would look down on others. They would despise others. And then God, God is saying the, the drunken and you, the elite scholars, are all bound by the same sin. Because if you, back in the Old Testament, if you could not keep the, entire, the entirety of the law, let's say you kept nine of the commandments but messed up with one, you broke the entire law, the entire Ten Commandments, and were condemned by it. And the elite, Jesus wasn't teaching people that they must keep these two commandments to be right with God. Jesus was showing them that with only two commandments, he would show that everyone was under condemnation with the law. That is the purpose of the law. Everyone will be stopped and every person becomes guilty before God. You can see that in Romans 3.19. And why does God use the law to make everyone see their guilt? Why does he use the law so, he could, so everybody could see their guilt? So he can reveal the promise of Romans 3.21. The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed and it is received by faith. Through Jesus Christ. If you're going to follow the law, it means you keep it 100%. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. So you either are perfect, 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 or you are under condemnation of the law. And you can't escape it. The only way you escape it, according to Romans 7, is for those who have died and are free from it. This is where we begin to learn what it means to have an exchanged life. God does not intend to take the sinner and fix his or her old life. God intends to bury the old and resurrect you into a new life. Do you see the exchange that we are given? There's a beautiful exchange that he has given. He doesn't want to take you and fix you up, like patch you up. No, he wants to bury your old life and resurrect you into a brand new, precious life. But in order to do that, you have to look at the work of the cross. Through the conviction of the law of sin and death, God reveals our needs and invites us to come to his gift of life by faith on the cross. And Jesus accomplished several important things through the cross. When you go to the cross, when you look at the cross, when you examine the cross, you know that Jesus bore all the judgment of sin under the law on our behalf. That cross was meant for you and for me, but through the cross, Jesus bore all of the judgment, all of the sin on our behalf. On the cross, Jesus takes away the sins. Jesus does away with sin on the cross. On the cross, he buries our old nature. On the cross, he resurrects us into a new spiritual nature. On the cross, he places his spirit within us. He gives us his righteousness, and he places us in his promise. This is the exchange that he is doing on our behalf. You and I, instead of trying to hold on to the law, instead of trying to hold on to these old religion, religious theories, let him give us that exchange, accept the exchange that he, that he offers Understanding the work of the cross is important. 
Because if you don't understand what happened on the cross, you're not going to know where to turn for, for hope or for direction. You're always going to be looking at the wrong places. You're going to be looking in every area but. Religion points you back to your old life and tries to order you to do the impossible. Have you ever been stuck in the same thing over and over in a cycle because you're trying to do it in the flesh? You're trying to be religious about it. You're trying to do it on your own when that's not what you were called. He has given us an exchange. He did it all for you. He took it upon himself so you don't have to do it on your own. Religion makes us go back to the impossible to fix something that God has already relegated to the grave. He's already buried it. And yet you and I are constantly trying to dig it up and trying to fix something that is dead. This causes people to search for answers in human efforts. The problem is that you can't fix what God has crucified and buried. You can't fix it. You can try. You can waste your time. It is foolish to try to empower the flesh and try to make it act contrary to its nature. But through Christ, you've escaped it. Through Christ, you've received freedom. Through Christ, you've been delivered. Through Christ, you are a new creature. Yet we are constantly trying to dig up the old. 2 Peter 1.4 tells us that we have escaped the corruption. This promise also comes with a warning. If having escaped, you are again entangled, your current conditions will be even worse than when you didn't know the truth. How many of you have seen it in our churches and in different churches where people who leave the Lord and go into this world and then they come back to church? Some people don't leave church, but they go back to religion. And then they have no peace. They have no joy. They have no confidence. Many Christians live their lives with less joy than people out in the world. And that's a sad statement. The Bible promises that God's perfect love casts out all fear. And yet we have a lot of Christians living in fear, living in doubt, with no confidence at all. They have no confidence in God's acceptance, and live as though they had never been saved from sin. Because their trust, it has been turned back from Christ to the power of sin. And it rules them. And it shows. It shows through our fear. It shows through our doubts. It shows through our struggles. It shows through our sinful habits. That at one point, it had lost its power over us. Do you remember when you first accepted the Lord? Do you remember when you first said yes to him and he came into your heart? Do you remember how excited you were? There was nothing that could stop you. You were reading the Bible. You were praying. You were at church. You were fasting. You were on fire for God. Things that you used to do, you just kind of stopped doing them. Things that you were drawn to, you kind of lost interest and you, you were so focused on God and you were growing and, and, and you were bold. You would speak to people about what Jesus did for you. Then you start seeing Christians turn back. Then you see them in fear and then you see them doubting if God loves them. Then you see them struggling once again. Then you see them like going back to these sinful habits that they had been freed from. These things occur because the Christian soul can only have rest in the life of the spirit. And the spirit does not operate through the flesh. So when a Christian tries to fix or mix the two, there is no life, there is no power as an overcomer. Those who look to the flesh for hope or power are worse off than those who had never, who are still in the flesh. You have to look at the cross over the flesh. The flesh is our physical body. 
We are born into a fleshy spirit that was dead to God and naturally operates in sin. Sin is anything that misses the mark. Sin is anything in this life that misses the mark. The Bible describes our old life in the flesh this way. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. You see, sin, it's not just lying, adultery, stealing, all those big things that we think about when we think about sin. It is anything of the flesh. Our old human nature was driven by flesh. Human nature is of the flesh and will always miss the mark of the glory of God. Romans 7, 14 explains that the law is spiritual, but man is of the flesh. He is carnal. The Bible also explains that the natural man cannot receive or discern the things of God. He cannot do the things of God. Isaiah 64, 6 also explains all our attempts at righteous, at, at a righteous acts are filthy in God's sight. The Apostle Paul had been a Pharisee and spent his life working to accomplish all the deeds of the law when he discovered Christ. And then he calls all the acts of the law, all those righteous acts, he calls them as trash compared to the gaining of Christ. If the deeds of human efforts were trash before Christ, then they are still trash after Christ. So the person who turns back to the old dead ways of living, even if it's religious, is turning back to the same trash they escaped from before they found their life in Christ. But yet now it's worse. It's worse because now it is incompatible to who they are. When you were in your old life, you had not been born again of the Spirit. Now that you've been born again of the Spirit, when you decide to go back to religion, when you decide to go back to your old self, when you think that you have to fix things in your own strength and in your own might, you are going to have a harder time now because you're born of the Spirit, but you're trying to mix it in with the flesh, and it's not going to work. We have already looked at how the law reveals to us that we are sinful, that we are in our flesh. Our flesh can't rise to the requirement of perfection needed to have union with God when you're basing it on the law. Then the law points us to Christ with the invitation to receive the promise of new life. However, to receive something must be removed. And this is where faith enters. Faith calls us to release everything so that God can remove it in exchange for something better. You're called to faith, church. You're not called to do it in your strength. You're called to surrender to God. You're called to believe God. If God said it, it is true. If God said it, remove your doubts. It will be done. God wants to give you something better. He's, he's offering you that new spirit with a new nature. Along with it comes the gift of righteousness. Only then can we begin to walk in the life of faith. Our spiritual growth is not trying to become better, but learning how to let go of the old ways of thinking so we can take on the new ways of thinking. Our minds are so set on our flesh, on our own strength. I have to, I admire our pastor, my husband. I really do. I know there was a, a group of people from this church that did what they were supposed to do as believers. They went out and they helped our community. They helped people by boarding up their windows and, and securing things, helping people that, that needed help, and I applaud them for it. I think 
it was the godly thing to do. It was the righteous thing to do. Um, and I thank you for it. Um, if I'm honest, I wanted my husband to call you guys um, to come and do our house. Because we have a pool. We have some trees in the back. And we have these windows um, in the, the whole back of the, the house. And I was like, man, I want to get these three windows boarded. And... <laughs> And um, my husband's like, no, I don't want to board them up. And I'm like, why not? We should be precautious. We should, you know. He goes, no, because God's going to take care of our house. We're taking care of other people, and God's going to take care of our house. I'm like, yeah, babe, but we need to be responsible. You know, we need to do things, you know, so that we could secure our house. And he's like, we did. We cleared the backyard. We, you know, anything that could be a projectile, whatever, we cleared it up. But I'm not going to board my house. I'm going to trust God. I'm like, okay. So then a couple hours would come by, and then I spoke to Arlene, and like, oh, yeah, the guys boarded up everything. You know, my house is safe. My house is secure. And I'm like, yeah, babe, I think we should get the guys to come up here and board our house. And he's like, Yvette, we're going to be fine. I'm trusting God. Everything's going to be fine. I'm like, okay. So in that moment, I was trying to protect my house, protect my belongings in my own might, in my own strength, with I, which I agree with. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. But I had a choice. I was like, am I going to trust God that my house will be fine, that we're going to be fine, or am I going to try to do things in my own strength? And I know this might sound like a silly example, but this is what we do. This is what we do every single day of our lives. God is saying, let go, let me do. And we're like, no, you know what? I'm going to hold on to this because I think I can do a better job. Because I know what I want. I know what I want to accomplish. So God, just let me do it. And we continuously do this in our lives. Instead of saying, you know what, God? You're right. You're asking me to let go. You're asking me. You're calling me to faith. You're calling me to trust you. And I want to turn back to my old ways, to my flesh, when you have given me this beautiful exchange of living in the spirit, of having faith and trusting you wholeheartedly. You see, Jesus died in weakness, but was resurrected into incorruptible glory. And when you trust your life to Christ, you enter the work Jesus revealed on the cross. You, the old you, you are buried with Christ. We as Christians, we were crucified with Christ so that our body of sin might be done away with. Then you are entering into the promise that God gave back in Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. Where God promised to take our sinful heart, our sinful nature, out of us and give us a new heart, a new nature that is born of God. He will give us a new spirit that is born of God. And he will give us his spirit to live within us. That is an amazing exchange. We are united with God through our new spirit and his Holy Spirit within us. That means that you are in constant fellowship with God, even when you don't realize it. In the flesh, you will be blind to the life of the Spirit. And this is why most people can't see the depth of the relationship that God has brought. How many of you, if I were to ask you to raise your hands this morning, I'm not going to ask you to, but I still will, I will ask the question. But if you were to be honest, completely, completely honest, if I were to ask you today, how many of you are 100% sure that if the rapture happened this instant, you would leave and you would be in heaven? Don't raise your hand. The sad thing about it is, I venture to say that the majority of people could not say 100%, I'm going to heaven. Because we doubt, we fear, we don't accept God's promises, we don't accept what he has said. He died for you. He took your sins. He gave you a new spirit, yet we hold on to the old and we can't accept God's grace, God's mercy over our lives. So how many of us live in fear, not wanting Jesus to return just yet because we haven't gotten things right 
on our own yet. Instead of saying, God, I can't do this without you. Instead of saying, God, I surrender. I'm going to trust you. If there are things in my life that I'm still struggling with, it's because I haven't let you do what you want to do with them. It's because I'm still trying to fix it. It's because I'm still trying to get a hold of them and make them right. When that's not the answer, the answer is let it go. Ask God to do what he and only he can do. If you're still struggling with, with, with an addiction, with things in your past, with things that you haven't been able to let go of, have you surrendered it to God? Or are you trying to be righteous? Are you trying to fix them in your own power, in your own strength? But here's what we do. We hide ourselves in the room, turn on our computer, watch things that we're not supposed to watch, and think and say, God, I'm still struggling with this. Help me. You haven't surrendered to God. You're not accepting the exchange of life that God is giving you. Why not, when you're being tempted by the flesh, channel, connect to the spirit that God has given you and say, you know what? I'm going to go pray in my living room. Don't go to your room. Why make it harder? Go to your living room, out in public. Call someone to say, look, can we pray in this moment? You don't even have to tell them why. But when you surrender to God in the spirit, knowing that you can't do it, he's the one that's going to transform you. He's the one that's going to help you deal with that sin. He's the one that's going to cleanse you. It will never be by your efforts. It's only through him. Yet we continuously try to fix things on our own. Instead of accepting the beautiful exchange that he has given us. When you are trying to do things on your own, you're trying to keep the law. And when you're trying to keep the law, you're disobeying the truth. And the efforts that you put forth to keep the law is called the works of the flesh. This is why so few Christians grow towards maturity and they struggle with sin over and over again because they continuously try to follow the law. People may think that giving control to the flesh for the purpose of keeping the law is good. But the flesh will only keep the law if it boasts the eagle through pride. There are many of us believers that think, I'm going to keep the law. I'm going to seek God with all I have. I'm going to love my neighbors. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm going to honor my parents and da 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 And then they... They, they start trying to keep the law. Then they, they join 777 ministry, which I'm not criticizing. I, I, I love that ministry. But I'm sure there are people that are in 77 ministry because it makes them feel spiritual. Because it makes them feel like they're righteous, like they're obeying the law, like they're doing good. And you have to be careful because none of that None of that, none of that is transforming. What transforms us is when you put your faith in God. What transforms us is when you believe what he has said. What transforms us is when you allow the Holy Spirit to direct your steps. Because I've always said this, the more you pray, the more connected you are with God, the more you seek God's presence, the more humble you become. The more you feel unworthy and dirty and messed up. And then when you see those people that are up there, oh, yeah, I prayed. I was fasting. God spoke to me. God said this to me. Ah, da, 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 da. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. You look like you're keeping the law and a lot of ego is coming out of you. Keeping the law doesn't do anything for us. It, de it deceives us. It makes us think that we're the ones that are called to accomplish God's work. We are not called to accomplish what only God can do. If God said we have escaped the law, why would we turn back and submit to it? 
if God said that the law was taken out of the way by being nailed to the cross, why does religion try to resurrect it from the grave? We need to receive the exchange that only God, that only Jesus can offer. Can we all stand?